Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Jonah Davies uh, from Harvard Medical Center in Seattle. We're just going to give uh, another 30 seconds or so uh, to let some people uh, filter in. This is the trauma, um, AO Trauma Fellows webinar, and today the uh, topic is scapula and glenoid fractures. Um, the faculty today is uh, sort of uh, we're extremely lucky to have this faculty um, from the University of Minnesota. We have Peter Cole, uh, who's going to um, has extensive uh, knowledge and um, uh, you know developing approaches and 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 really pushing the, this forward. Uh, we have uh, Bob R. Shafik um, from John Hopkins and uh, Andy Chu from uh, University of uh, uh, Texas in Houston. Um, so really great faculty and um, really lucky to have everybody on here uh, tonight. So I'd like to thank them in advance. Uh, as you know, the content validation uh, from the AO North America is independent nonprofit uh, uh, society. Um, we don't necessarily endorse or promote any of the use of specific products or services or commercial entities. Uh, and this is um, uh, being used for teaching purposes. Uh, here's a disclosure slide, which will be obviously available in the recording. Um, and so uh, here's the agenda. Uh, we'll start with uh, a couple of lectures. Uh, the topics are going to be uh, indications for surgery, uh, followed by approaches. And then uh, we'll, we'll finish with uh, techniques for reduction and fixation, because I think that these as trauma fellows are uh, probably some of the most important things to understand when to operate on these patients, how to get to the bone, and then how to uh, reduce the bone and, um, and get it fixed uh, stably uh, to allow your patients to rehab properly. So we'll do the lectures. Uh, that'll be about 30 minutes total. Uh, so 10 minutes for each lecture. And then we'll uh, have some cases uh, that we'll go through, try to um, discuss the topics that we you know, saw in the lectures and apply them to real real world cases. Um, and uh, at the end, we'll wrap up, should, should be about uh, an hour and, and 15 minutes or an hour and 20 minutes total. Uh, at any time, please don't hesitate to post questions into the Q&A. We'll be monitoring it with the answer. We'll try to answer them live if we can. Um, there's not a ton of people on, and there may not be a ton by the end of the night, but hopefully, um, you know, that just means it's more intimate and you get to ask the questions that you want and you get the answers that you're seeking from some world-class faculty. So uh, with that in mind, um, I will stop sharing. And Bob, if you want to take over. Yeah, thank you, Jonah. Thanks for having me, I appreciate it. Um, looking forward to talking about this topic. Uh, I'm practice orthopedic trauma at Johns Hopkins, um, and I'm going to be talking about classification and surgical indications. So let me share my screen. And hopefully everyone's seeing the uh, slideshow. There we go. So classification and surgical indications. Uh, these are my disclosures. Uh, at the end of this session, uh, you should be able to describe common scapula and glenoid fracture classifications, understand which fractures may benefit from surgical treatment. Uh, so scapular fractures make up around 1% to 2% of all fractures. Uh, they make up 3 to 5% of shoulder injuries. Uh, the recognition of scapular fractures is somewhat on the rise. Uh, more higher energy trauma is happening, and we're getting pan-CT, so we're seeing these injuries more than we were in the past but they're still relatively uncommon. Um, because the scapula is enveloped in muscle from the front and back, they typically require high energy blunt force trauma to, to happen. Um, so, you know, the force typically occurs in this manner, either at the point of the shoulder or on the chest wall itself, oftentimes from the back. Uh, so this is really a typical direction that you'll see. Uh, so with that chest injury, about 90% of them will have an associated injury to the chest and include rib fractures, pulmonary contusion, pneumothoraces, and then also closed head injuries. The scapula is a complex bone. Uh, generally, we think uh, about the major components of it uh, in general orthopedics. Uh, we are commonly uh, very comfortable uh, thinking about the coracoid, the acromion, the glenoid itself, and, and the body. Uh, but really, if we're gonna start 
uh, treating the scapula and operating on it, we need to know it in uh, much more detail. So let's add some more key osseous structures. We'll start at the top. The superior angle is a spot where we'll often send uh, fixation from the medial uh, spinomedial angle, which is where the spine meets the medial border. And the spine is uh, easily palpable. Uh, it fractures frequently uh, when you do have a scapular body fracture, uh, and it's a great place for fixation because it's excellent bone. Spinal glenoid notch is where we'll find our nerve, uh, and fractures will often exit in this area. Uh, the lateral and medial border uh, are areas of displacement that we'll see radiographically and are also areas where we apply fixation. Uh, and the inferior angle is needed to help uh, measure the glenopolar angle. So you want to get your films to show the inferior angle when you get your films. There are many deforming forces that contribute to displacement. Uh, this isn't all of them. There's actually 18 muscles uh, either originating or inserting in the scapula. Uh, and they all contributed to deformity. Uh, chest wall and the humerus also act in contributing to deformity. Uh, but the vectors of deformity are typically translational or rotational, uh, and they'll either lead to medial lateral displacement or some form of angulation. Uh, medial lateral displacement can be referred to as lateral border offset. It's a term we're using more. It's formally described as medialization, which tends to be somewhat confusing. Uh, but this is a common uh, direction of displacement of the scapula body relative to the glenoid. Uh, rotation affects glenopolar angle. So that's the angle of the glenoid relative to the rest of the scapular body. And uh, it's a key indicator for uh, operative uh, management. The structures at risk surgically are not that many. Uh, they're easily found. They're consistently where you expect them to be. The circumflex scapular artery uh, found in the triangular space. Uh, we, we run into this a lot when we place fixation uh, on the lateral border. Uh, so uh, you want to look for it and find it, and it can be easily uh, found and controlled. And the suprascapular nerve, of course, depending on the surgical approach you choose, may be at increased risk. And we'll get into that as we talk about approaches. Uh, let's move on to fracture classification. Uh, there are uh, some historical classifications, which I don't think we need to mention here. Uh, they're good to learn and read, but uh, the ones we typically use at this point are the Eidberg classification, really Mayo's modification of it, uh, because it's a useful classification of actual glenoid fractures, uh, as well as their extension into the body. And then the newer AOOTA classification uh, is helpful. So let's start with that. Uh, the basic classification describes the processes uh, and the glenoid fossa and the body as separate entities. We know they overlap and they uh, you have fractures that will uh, occur in all areas at times, uh, but uh, the classification really tries to divide it up because it's quite complex. So today's talk is not about the processes. We're really talking about the fossa or the glenoid uh, and the body. So the uh, classification uh, that focuses on the body involvement uh, is uh, part one of what we'll talk about. We'll talk about the glenoid involvement as well. Uh, and in this case, B stands for body uh, and uh, M stands for medial, so the medial border. L stands for the lateral border, S for the superior border and G if the fracture exits superior above the glenoid. Uh, this is a validated um, classification scheme uh, in the validation study that was done a few years ago now. 120 scapulas uh, were made into 3D videos and seven uh, selected trauma specialists uh, reviewed them and there was 82% agreement. So there's inter-rater reliability in using this classification scheme. Uh, an alternative part of it is the focus on glenoid involvement. Uh, and so we now uh, have a slight change in this, which is F0 represents FOSA. Uh, extra articular. So no uh, direct involvement of the joint itself, but it, it does separate it. Previously, we thought of these really as glenoid neck fractures, but, and we still do, but, uh, you know, the AO classification is calling this an extra articular uh, fossa fracture. Uh, this falls really well into what we already understand for articular fractures with the AO classification. F1 is going to be an intra-articular simple type fracture, and F2 is going to be a multi-fragmentary fracture. Also um, validations study. Uh, so this has not quite as good, but still good inter uh, observer agreement. So the value of this classification is that it's a validated system. It's based upon actual fractures 
uh, historical um, classifications were really not based upon actual fractures we saw, but this one is. Uh, so it can be used um, for research mostly. Uh, the downside of it is that it doesn't really include uh, any indications for when surgery should be done. Uh, it doesn't uh, guide operative approaches and it doesn't really guide implant choices. So it's not great for guiding management, but it, it can be useful to describe the fracture and then study the fractures. The Iber classification, on the other hand, uh, does guide treatment some. So this also an older classification. It does uh, reflect actual fractures pretty well. So type ones uh, and twos and threes are glenoid fractures, um, really not extending into the body. Uh, and what's valuable about this is that we know that from the majority of these, you can get to, to these from an anterior approach. Uh, the posterior glenoid, you need a posterior approach, but you can, really get to, you can really get to these from an anterior approach most of the time. Uh, as opposed to the higher grade uh, fractures, which also involve the glenoid, but then extend into the body, uh, these will frequently require either a posterior approach or a combination of the posterior and anterior approach. All right, so in order to be able to uh, classify, we need uh, radiographs and we need to get reproducible radiographs. So a Gracie or a true AP uh, like this one is going to show you the glenoid. Uh, it's also going to show you the whole scapula, including the inferior angle. Uh, so you, you really want to include the whole scapula on it. Axillary is going to show you uh, process fractures, uh, whether the shoulder is located, and also glenoid uh, anterior and posterior rim fractures. So it's useful to have this. And then the Y view is going to demonstrate the uh, angulation of the body. Uh, we're all familiar with these views. CT scan, critical. Uh, I'd say that the axial CT scan uh, is important for the glenoid, but it's hard to make out the body uh, and the amount of displacement. So we've really moved to uh, getting 3D CTs on everybody. Uh, you can get really high quality CT scans or, or like this one, which I can make just on my desktop. Most of us now have technology where, or the, I should say the uh, software on your desktop, you can just make it yourself. So I routinely make 3D CT scans myself on my desktop whenever I want. Uh, and I can see just about everything I want, subtract what I need to subtract. Really important to get the 3D CT scan. Uh, measurement terms that we need to be familiar with for our indications are glenopolar angle, uh, angulation of the body, uh, lateral border offset, formerly known as medialization and articular step off, because these are numbers that we can measure. So uh, glenopolar angle normally is 35 degrees or above, uh, and um, it's measured by an angle uh, from the bottom to the top of the glenoid and then to the uh, inferior angle of the scapula. Uh, multiple studies have demonstrated uh, that less than 20 degrees results in poorer outcomes. Uh, so really, you know, a conservative uh, indication would probably be somewhere around that. Uh, in our group, we're using 22 degrees as our indication. Uh, angulation on the scapular Y. Uh, the scapula has a slight curve to it, uh, but not significant angulation like this. Uh, if left alone, this results in crepitance, prominence, pain when sitting uh, to a backrest. Uh, multiple studies have talked about severe angulation uh, greater than 30 degrees. Uh, we're using 45 degrees as our indication for surgery. Uh, lateral border offset. Uh, again, also measured on the Gracie view or on a rotated 3D CT scan into a Gracie view, if you will. Uh, and so displacement, you know, many fractures, we tolerate not two full centimeters of displacement. Uh, but in this case, uh, most officers are, are suggesting around two centimeters is an indication uh, for fixation. And if you, if you think about that lateral border uh, displacing, either laterally or the glenoid displacing medially, you're going to have length tension relationship if your rotator cuff affected. Articular step off, a non weight bearing joint. Uh, most weight bearing joints were tolerating two millimeters or less uh, for reasons we are all familiar with. Uh, but uh, in the glenoid, uh, all the views that you get are going to demonstrate some form of step off. So you can measure it pretty much on every one of the three radiographic views or on the CT scan. And conservative estimates really are that four millimeters is likely tolerated. Uh, with uh, uh, lower incidence of symptomatic arthritis. So it's a uh, greater amount of displacement that we tolerate. Uh, multiple disruptions, we'll probably talk about that during the cases, but we'll narrow down our indications when we have multiple disruptions. All right. So for take home messages, uh, there are multiple classification schemes. Uh, there's historical, uh, but the newer ones are based upon uh, actual clinical data sets. Uh, the AOTA is a validated system. It helps us uh, probably for defining clinical outcomes if we study this. 
uh, but it doesn't really offer indications or guide treatment. Uh, surgical indications really are still based upon expert opinions, but new literature is emerging. Uh, and these are our current conservative indications for operative management. Thank you. I'm going to unshare my screen. Yeah, that, that was excellent. Thank you so much. So I think that gives a really good um, overview of, of surgical indications, gives people kind of an idea of when to sort of, when to decide to fix these fractures. And we're going to follow with Andy uh, Chu, uh, who's going to talk to, uh, to us about approaches. So let's say once we've decided to fix these, now we got to figure out what, how we're going to get to those fractures. So Andy, do you want to take over? Okay. All right. Thank you, uh, Jonah. Thanks for having me. So I'm going to talk about posterior approach for scapula fractures. Uh, I'm going to sort of go on the assumption that um, not too many people want to hear about the anterior approach, at least at this level for now. So um, I'm Andy Chu from UT Houston. Um, and so we're going to start with the case. This is a 24-year-old male who presented status post in MBC. You can take a quick look at these images. And like Barbara said, you really want to get some advanced imaging for these kind of refractures. So the question we always ask ourselves is, is this something that's going to need surgery? And you can tell that this is a little difficult to assess this fracture at this point. But you get some advanced imaging. And I think hopefully most of you can see that there's a pretty good amount of intraarticular displacement. Uh, and so I would say that this definitely is a fracture that will need operative intervention. So the question is, how do we get there? How do we address this fracture once we decide that it needs to be fixed? And so in this talk, I'm going to clarify some nomenclature of the various posterior approaches. Uh, I'm going to talk about what I consider the important components of a posterior approach and then you know, use this example to sort of go through uh, what we're talking about. And I think part of the problem is that there's a lot of confusion about the nomenclature, about what people talk about when they're talking about a posterior approach or a Judea approach. There is sort of the classic, uh, or it's called the extensile Judea approach. Um, there's this big sort of bucket where people call a modified Judea approach. Uh, Peter Cole, who we'll hear from later, has uh, described to us the minimally invasive windows, or you can do a combined approach with anterior and posterior approaches. So I think it's helpful to go back to the original literature because I think there is still some confusion about it, and it doesn't help that this was written in French. Uh, but this is the original Judea paper out of 1964, and what he originally described uh, was the skin incision that I think most of you are, are fairly familiar with the sort of boomerang approach paralleling the uh, scapular spine and the medial border. Uh, but really it described essentially taking everything off, uh, off of this, um, this interval and reflecting it, including the deltoid, the infraspinatus, the teres minor. It was, I hesitate to use the term knife to bone, but it, it was almost sort of a knife to bone, take everything off of the scapula. And sort of this is the, the, uh, the image you get. You can see it, although it's sideways, the spinal glenoid notch and the entire neurovascular bundle is retracted um, inferiorly and laterally. So this is a paper that um, is somewhat famous. It's 2004 from uh, Dr. Bremsky. And this was describing sort of what he described as the modified Judea approach where he started with the same skin incision, but then elevated the deltoid and then worked and found the interval between the infraspinatus and the teres minor. And so this is what was often described as the modified Judea instead of taking everything off and re reflecting it as one unit. Uh, finding an intermuscular internervous interval. But if you look back, like many things in orthopedics, this was actually described even earlier, 1997. And this is interesting because this is the first uh, instance I found of what's considered or what's sometimes called a reverse Judea, where the skin incision is reversed, but still they take down the deltoid and find the interval between the infraspinatus and the teres minor. And again, even in 2000, uh, in German, they describe, again, working in intervals, again, taking down the posterior head of the deltoid and uh, reflecting the infraspinatus from both the proximal and distal extents. Um, and so when somebody says to you that they're, they're doing a modified Judea, exactly what do they mean by a modified Judea? I think it's not a consistent description. So I think in my mind, when I'm sort of uh, conceptualizing this, I think it's better to break it down into certain components. We can start with positioning then the skin incision, management of the deltoid, the infraspinatus, and then if you do need to address intraarticular involvement, how do you get to the joint? So positioning, I'd be interested to hear my, my uh, uh, co-presenters tonight there. I think there's basically two main ways, lateral 
and benefit of laterals, it does give you access to the anterior structures, but it can make imaging more difficult and sometimes uh, akin to an uh, acetabular fracture. Um, if you need to get into the joint, the, the gravity will is pulling the humeral head toward the glenoid. Uh, prone, uh, there are proponents of prone positioning. I think maybe it gives you a little bit better, you know, easier flora imaging, maybe a bit, a bit better glenohumeral visualization, but uh, again, I'll show you my preference in a minute. So the incision, again, there's a standard sort of this uh, boomerang judae, which has been described. There is the reverse judae, which is essentially paralleling the, the same superior limb, but uh, instead of uh, heading medially, it goes laterally. And I, I find this quite useful. I do it quite a bit. Uh, most of the pathology you need to address is actually superior and lateral. And so I think this brings you to a better place. If you do this lateral as I do, the flap is just retracted by gravity. Um, I will say that the, if you look at it, the angle is certainly more acute and potentially it's less forgiving if you don't have it centered appropriately. But uh, I do use this quite a bit, especially when there's really nothing to do medially uh, on a scapula fracture. What I'm, I haven't mentioned here is a little bit about what, again, what Peter Cole described about limited windows. But uh, I think uh, for most of us starting out, you know, most people starting out doing these, uh, it's probably you would want to start with more of an extensile approach. So deltoid, how do you manage the deltoid? You can certainly leave it in place and just elevate it and work underneath it. This is especially good for simple or extra articular fractures or those with exit points that are low in the infrasmedius or the lateral border. I think those are much easier to get to without having to take down the deltoid. Or you can take down the deltoid and reflect it. And this is very um, advantageous, especially if you need to go uh, intra-articular, if you have fractures that are uh, you need to see right along the scapular neck or the spinal glenoid notch. Those are very difficult to see with the deltoid in place. And in addition, I would say that a lot of times if you're addressing a fracture that goes to the scapular spine, you're taking down part of it anyway. So what about the infraspinatus? So you can elevate it as a flap or you can work in the intramuscular intervals that are described. Again, uh, distally you find the infraspinatus teres minor interval. You can elevate it off of the scapular spine superiorly, and especially if you're going to put plates on the medial side, then you usually end up elevating some of the origin medially. And so if you really separate or, or release all three of these borders, uh, you can also just completely mobilize it from the fossa and reflect it on its pedicle. And here's an illustration of that. And this really gives you maximum visualization of the posterior scapula. You can see that uh, instead of sort of the classic due day, you're actually reflecting the neurovascular pedicle proximally rather than distally, which is potentially a little bit more forgiving. So one of the things I found difficult, and I will admit the first probably dozen of these I did, I, I was in the wrong interval. And so it's usually described as you just sort of identify the teres minor infraspinatus interval and bluntly dissect it. And I will tell you that it's not always that simple. Sometimes it's obvious, sometimes it's not. And I think that the difficulty is if you look at many textbooks, you don't really uh, sort of appreciate exactly where the interval is. Uh, and it wasn't until I looked at this actual specimen anatomic textbook that I, you know, it sort of illustrates this difficulty. If you see these labels, <clears throat> the top is the infraspinatus, the bottom is the teres minor, but they look like they're the same muscle. And the problem is that the investing fascia over them is all the same fascia. So the obvious interval, if you're doing this for the first time, is actually the teres minor, teres major interval, because those are in separate fascial compartments. It's not until you elevate the fascia that you can sort of like a, a sort of get a better understanding of where the teres minor infraspinatus interval is. And another helpful thing I found is actually understanding the anatomy of the infraspinatus. This is a tripennate muscle. It has three parts, a cranial part, a central part, and a caudal part. And, and the central part, as you get more laterally, has this sort of thin fat stripe, uh, which you could hopefully see in that specimen on the upper right. And then you see a muscle right below it, and that is your, the bottom uh, limb of the infraspinatus, and the interval is just below that. So if you do have an intraarticular fracture and you're trying to visualize it from the posterior side, what are your options? So if you have a simple fracture pattern, you can use extraarticular reads, much like an acetabular fracture, to get your joint reduction. You can use an arthroscope, which I will admit I've done a couple of times, uh, especially with some of the newer small scope technology. I actually found it helpful uh, just recently in a case last week. Or you can do a full open arthrotomy. The problem is if you do it in the lateral position, it's still very, very difficult to visualize the joint. So what I've done in the past is put a shan spin into the humeral head and use that as, uh, as traction. Um, you can use a small joint distractor, which is actually my preferred technique at this point. You can also use a combined anterior approach to visualize the joint from the front. Other things described, which I haven't personally done, are an infraspinatus tenotomy, which would be sort of uh, akin to doing a subscapularis takedown from the front, and also, uh, a chromial osteotomy, which I've never done or felt the need to do, but it's described. 
So let's uh, just use our guy as an illustration here. How do we position him? Uh, I'm gonna go lateral, or sorry, we'll talk about positioning in the skin incision. So again, um, all of his pathologies on the superior and the lateral side, uh, there's really nothing to do medially. So for certainly for this fracture, I would normally consider um, a reverse Judea incision, but he also has a sacromial fracture, which may complicate things a little bit. And so in order to extend this, I'm gonna do a standard Judea incision, but then extend it a little bit anteriorly so I can uh, make a sort of a smoother continuous incision. Here he is in the lateral position. I have it marked out. What about the deltoid? This is an intraarticular fracture. This is uh, after elevation of the flap. You can see faintly the deltoid interval. It's marked out here with the freer between the deltoid and the infraspinatus. I release the deltoid off the scapular spine, tag it with multiple non-absorbable sutures, and then reflect it. For the infraspinatus here, it's, uh, his was nice and obvious. Um, you can actually sort of uh, see I'm pressing the uh, elevator between the infraspinatus and the teres minor. I will tell you that this should not take you over the lateral edge of the lateral border should take you sort of about a centimeter medial to it. And then you can bluntly elevate that. And then this is working in that interval to see what we can see. You can also use or reflect the infraspinatus distally. You can see the scapular spine and the scapular spine exit points. But in his case, especially given his articular involvement, uh, we did reflect uh, and elevate and reflect the entire infraspinatus off of its pedicle as described earlier. So what about the joint? He does have an intraarticular fracture. This is a small joint distractor I was talking about. Uh, this is uh, actually meant, I think, for, for feet, but uh, it has a three millimeter pin you can place into the humeral head. Uh, another pin you can place immediately along the scapular spine, which is the best bone, and then use it to actually distract your joint. And in doing so, you can get a good visualization of the intraarticular surface after you do an arthrotomy. So here's a little bit of labeling. Uh, the humeral head and the glenoid, you can see the intraarticular fracture. Um, you can see the lateral border of the scapula to the inferior side of the screen. And finally, in this case, if you remember his imaging, he did have a very large articular fragment involving the coracoid base and the superior glenoid. Um, you can see that I've made a small accessory incision anteriorly, and I've passed a clamp around the coracoid so I can manipulate that fragment. Once you use that for fra fragment for uh, the clamp for manipulation, you can look at the reduction and then place provisional wires. You can see the joint reduction here, pretty good and then complete fixation in the standard fashion. Uh, in addition, you can see we did fix his uh, acromion, not necessarily because it needed it, because it was also uh, readily available for fixation. So here's the uh, imaging, or sorry, uh, intraoperative photos after fixation has been done. You can see the plates along the medial or the lateral side, as well as the inferior aspect of the lateral border along the scapular spine, and it looks like a morbid approach, but once you start closing everything, I uh, use drill holes in the scapular spine to repair the posterior deltoid. It actually looks pretty good. Even made his tattoo look nice. Here he is post-operatively, and then at three months. Thank you. That was great, Andy. Um, I think it, reflects a, a lot of what we see when we're starting out to try to not knowing where to find interval or you know it's, it's very common so I feel like I, I don't feel so alone anymore now that I heard you heard you gave that talk um, one of the things that I've been doing is using an arm like a spider instead of um, a positioner and and that can pull some traction sometimes too much traction so you just got to watch out but it does um, allow you to get some joint visualization I, I like your little trick of using that uh, a small joint distractor because that's a that's a cool trick also um okay so now that we've got it all exposed uh we're gonna get peter Pohl to talk to us about how to get it reduced and some trips and tricks and and how to fix it and so uh, peter if you don't mind um continuing the momentum that'd be great All right. Uh, uh, good evening, everybody. Um, I presume you can hear me now. Uh, it's great to be here. And uh, it's always wonderful to uh, learn from other folks' talks. Uh, uh, this has been great so far. 
I'm going to try to focus on specifically the tricks of uh, reduction and fixation. Uh, these are my disclosures. So, um, you know, frequently uh, we are, um, uh, you, can, you can become overwhelmed uh, with the three-dimensional CT scan and the good imaging that, uh, that um, allows for us and, and really um, uh, become very confused about, uh, uh, you, you know, where to start and, and what to do and how to get these fragments reduced. Um, once you um, determine what approach you're going to do based on the fracture pattern, which could involve an extensile Jude, the modified, as uh, uh, nicely demonstrated by Dr. Shu, uh, perhaps a straight posterior approach. If there's no involvement of that uh, base of the spine or vertebral border, uh, consider that. Um, and uh, and the, uh, the windows approach, once you get familiar with the deforming forces and how to reduce things, you can work through very small windows to capture uh, the displaced borders of the scapula. I, I think something's very important to point out too, that um, I've done the anatomical dissections on detaching the deltoid or leaving the deltoid intact, even through the modified Jude. So, um, I uh, currently have a, uh, a paper, a clinical paper submitted uh, uh, called the deltoid sparing modified Jude, as if the previous nomenclature wasn't confusing enough. Only there was only 10% greater gain in a cadaveric study that I did by taking down the deltoid. So my message is you don't have to take down the deltoid. You don't need to detach it. Um, it, is, um, uh, it, it has uh, uh, associated with it uh, slower rehabilitation. And, uh, and this has been uh, published uh, previously, my uh, cadaver work. So uh, keep that in mind. Now, the tools to aid reduction include a chance pin, uh, uh, young bluth, a lamina spreader, shoulder hook, um, and, and multiple small pointed bone reduction forceps. Um, I'm going to uh, go over um, uh, just uh, some of the tools that I like at my disposal uh, during um, fracture surgery of the scapula. Uh, Dr. Cole, there's no um, uh, sound on that video, at least for us, that I can tell. Maybe uh, because it's going in your headset. Um, so if, if you want to comment or if you just want to. Oh, OK. Um, well, uh, yeah, so I just uh, shared my sound. Uh, tell me if you hear it now. Lenoid. And then yes, now we do. In the lateral border, and then I can manipulate the caudal and the cephalad fragment uh, right into to place. I just make these pilot holes so that you can set your clamp so they don't slide. Thank you. So um, these um, uh, really, uh, this is an illustration of the, the favorite tools uh, that I use. And um, again, a chance pin, 
great for the glenoid neck. You can use a four or a five millimeter. This Bankart shoulder awl, absolutely critical for the caudal segment. The lamina spreaders, particularly when we're often treating fractures that are uh, two, three, four weeks old, and I do a lot of malunion work. Um, so uh, very vital. Now I'm going to show you a number of open and uh, extensile approaches in which you know some of these tricks are used. So here, for example, is the use of the lamina spreader in a uh, uh, six old weak fracture that I had to mobilize the fracture callus. So you want to get in between the caudal and the cephalad segment. Um, this is a, a good trick too. You, you can put a chance pin on the um, superior and inferior border and then over a clamp with T-handled chucks, just crank it open and, and it's a very powerful technique. Um, you can see the placement of the chance pin in the cephalad segment in the glenoid neck and the use of a shoulder hook, which I like to put into a pilot hole as you see here. And that gives you a joystick on both sides. Um, in uh, the late presentation fractures, um, particularly with the use of the extensile approach, um, you can certainly use the uh, foot distractor. Uh, you can use um, the, the small distractor, uh, uh, the medium distractor, depending on the, uh, the, the severity of the deformity and the chronicity of it. Um, here it is applied through a modified uh, Jude in which uh, windows are used for the lateral and the medial borders. Here's the use of a small uh, distractor, which uh, really just takes the effort out of the picture and you can get your provisional reduction with a single plate and then put a parallel plate if you want. Um, you know, any clamp placed 90 degrees to a fracture can be squeezed as, as tight as, uh, as it's uh, designed to do so. Uh, so you're, you have your clamps available. You can go around the entire perimeter of the scapula and, and get everything reduced before you lay uh, things down. Here's a, a human dissection here, which um, uh, will also illustrate the use of these reduction aids. Frequently, a reduction clamp will be administered, you know, right here, like so, or possibly like so, depending on the obliquity of the fracture. When you have that scenario, what I like to do is to put a provisional plate on first. In other words, get a plate on around the clamp. So then once that plate is on, okay, then you can take your clamp off, let go, and then apply a second plate along the lateral border like that. You have to be able to reduce that lateral border because oftentimes this is off three, four centimeters. This is the choice location right here in the glenoid neck to apply a chance pin. Boom, just like that. I'm usually pushing that laterally and then I'm usually pulling the cephalad surface medially. So it's, it's this way to get that lateral border lined up. There's a, like a belt or a, a fan of tendinous insertion right along this glenoid neck which is attached to the long head of the triceps. What you can do is detach that long head of the triceps. I cut the, the long head of the triceps insertion, but through that tunnel, I can reach to the anterior glenoid and actually feel displacement of the anterior glenoid fracture. It's a typical plate configuration. Uh, here's some uh, demonstration uh, uh, live uh, through a modified Jude of, uh, you know, the tension on the lateral border. And then here on the right of your screen to the medial border. Um, so um, that's how you achieve your reduction, clamp it, provisional plate, uh, and then you can put on your uh, definitive plate. This is the shape of that vertebral angle plate. I like to call it the... Uh, the most complicated uh, contour in orthopedic trauma. Uh, it takes some practice. This is the uh, minimally invasive approach and you're working through very small uh, windows. Here are a couple of other tricks. In the extensile approach, I always uh, uh, repair my fascia through drill holes in the spine and the vertebral border. This is another good trick. Just use a coker clamp to uh, clamp down the plate. 
um, uh, to position it optimally before your screw placement. Uh, so this is the original fracture that uh, I demonstrated and through a, a principled uh, approach of reduction and fixation, you can um, uh, achieve uh, uh, alignment and anatomic reduction in most cases. I hope that was helpful. That was great. Um, I think a lot of times, like you said, people get lost in these 3D CTs. You know, where do I start? What are some good options? And I think you demonstrated really nicely um, that the number one thing for us is to, you know, pull things back out to sort of where they're they're supposed to be aligned. And it's, it can be difficult at first because, unfortunately, I, I don't know how it is in Minnesota, but for us, as you know, you know, someone gets seen in, in Montana, then gets referred to Spokane, then gets referred to Seattle. By the time we see them, it's three, four weeks. It can be very difficult. So uh, using all those tricks that you showed, I think is really, uh, really helpful. Um, and understanding, you know, that getting uh, those, those clamps you showed, if people don't know, those are modified clamps that can compress uh, 90 degrees to the fracture, um, which are basically just, you know, standard vapor clamps that are bent out to have straight um, if your hospital doesn't have them, or uh, like my hospital when I worked in Canada, they they would throw them out because they thought they were broken each time I bent them. Uh, there is a th those are available also sort of prefab, but if not, you can just just bend them straight, and um, that's really that is really helpful. So, um, if you guys are okay, since we're running a little bit over what we you know just a few minutes, I'm, I'm going to load up some cases, and um, we'll start with that. So. Um, Okay, so this case, uh, and also I just wanted to remind all the fellows on, I see some of the ones uh, I know, some of my fellows and some of my ex-residents, uh, don't hesitate to ask questions through the Q&A, now's a really good time. Uh, if you saw something and didn't understand in a case we did, or, or someone else uh, saw something and they wanted to understand more about the techniques, you have sort of some of the people who do the most of these in the country. Um, so it's a really good opportunity to ask questions and no one will uh, will reprimand you in this in this situation. So, okay, the first case, um, Andy, this is your case. Do you wanna just kind of uh, start us through it and then we can get some discussion points going? Sure, so uh, this is a 46 year old guy. He comes in after an ATV accident and uh, these are the initial trauma images we get. Um, sort of two of the same view and one of uh, an attempted scap Y maybe. And so as is, mentioned, I are, think, go ahead, sorry. No, I was gonna say, are, are, is anybody really making any decisions solely based on x-ray or is, is basically 100% uh, of these getting 3D CT? I, I mean, at my institution, any, anything like this would get a CT before I even took a look at it, probably before they even called me about it. Um, but I would say that if that's not happening, uh, that, that this should be something like this should be sort of a knee jerk CT, I would say. How about at Hopkins? A non displaced scapular fracture with good imaging does not need a CT scan. But I mean, something like this. Absolutely. Everything else yeah. gets a CT. Okay. Minnesota, I assume, same. Yeah, I, I uh, unless it's, uh, I, I try to make sure and educate the residents that um, um, not every scapula fracture requires a CT scan, but if there's a suspicion that it could be operative, then they always get one. Perfect. So I'll, uh, I can run through these. All right, so Andy, what was your thought process about uh, this patient? Pretty young, uh, high, high level, high energy. Any other associated injuries that prevent them from getting surgery on this? No, this was an isolated injury. Um, I thought this was somewhat interesting because you can see he's got a, a reverse Silfax lesion and a posterior glenohumeral dislocation as well. Uh, and I wasn't exactly honestly sure how that would play out or if, you know, whether how much that would need to be addressed at the time. So. I think this will bring up a couple of other interesting points about uh, this particular fracture because it is also technically extra-articular 
in that there's no actual fracture through articular cartilage in this. Right, so I guess, um, would anybody try to get a closed reduction of this before uh, addressing this surgically? Is there any valid, you know, you know, validity to having the residents or even uh, fellows or attendings, you know, taking this to the to the PACU or something, sedating the patient, trying to reduce it? I don't really think so. Uh, I think that the the glenoid segment is quite mobile. It's already locked uh, with the reverse hill sacs that's present. I think you're going to. Uh, give sedation unnecessarily and probably very unlikely to be successful. I wonder. Peter, uh, any? Yeah, I, I agree with what's been stated. I prefer not uh, when when you uh, have a locked hill sacs. Um, uh, I prefer not to uh, try to reduce it without surgery. I, I guess you'll see what what we so we did try close reduction, and I guess the one thing I would say is that. Um, just for pure timing purposes, you know, this is going to be a long operation if you're going to fix the scapula. And I would feel a little bit better if I say, if it's a Tuesday and I'd say I have maybe time to do this on a Thursday or Friday, I'd feel better if the glenohumeral joint was reduced. And so if somebody was able to get a closed reduction, I think I'd feel a little bit better sitting on it for a couple of days uh, and planning rather than trying to maybe squeeze it in at the end of a long day or something like that. I think that might be the value of it, of at least hey. attempting one. Yeah, I I, um, I like that caveat that, uh, you know, to put them to sleep and uh, uh, get them paralyzed and then uh, possibly use a chance pin to uh, to uh, unlock that and reduce it. That is a great idea, Andy. I think if if that's the type of thing you're talking about, um, that, that would make sense to me. And I don't think it would cause any more harm, uh, but it's sort of that. Um, uh, blind closed reduction maneuver that I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to do. Yeah, I totally agree. So here's what was done. Um, and then that's the original CT, correct? That's not. Post. Yeah. He got a CT before the attempted reduction. Honestly, not sure on the imaging post-reduction, whether it's actually reduced or not, but at that point, uh, we had sort of made a decision on how to proceed. Okay, can so I, if I'm, yeah, go for it. Can I ask the, the condition of the suprascapular nerve and whether you could examine it at this point? Uh, that's a great question. And I, I have not been able to reliably um, examine the suprascapular nerve pre-op. Uh, I don't know if you guys have some other tricks. I can, I, you know, I do some, try to do something for the axillary, uh, but I've not been successful in actually assessing the suprascapular nerve prior to injury. I think you guys, Peter, have you guys Peter, been able to? Peter taught me years ago to put your hand on the infraspinatus fossa uh, and then coach some external rotation of the arm and you can feel contraction of the infraspinatus. And so that's how I'll tend to do it is I really want to get some palpation there. And then it just if they can just try, I can have some confidence that it's intact. I think in the in the acute setting, uh, there's no question it's hard. And if they don't externally rotate, you can attribute it to pain. But if they're lying 45 degrees in a bed and um, and their elbow is resting on on the mattress and they flex their elbow at, at 90 degrees, you you can you can usually get them to initiate an an external rotation maneuver, um, and um, and even when it's fractured uh, uh, like this, but this is certainly a high risk injury. It goes right up. Uh, the nerve's probably sitting in the fracture. And after three weeks, it's sitting in the callus. <laughs> so I guess the question is one, uh, obviously we want to you know, demonstrate this preoperative. We want to at least be able to document stuff. But if we can't, does that change your indication for surgery or just changes how you counsel patients postoperatively? counseling. Yeah, so most of that. Okay, so if I see this image, I'm thinking this patient needs surgery. Um, you know, my choice of approach for me personally would probably be a modified Judea. I don't tend to take the deltoid down just like uh, Peter showed in the last slides. Um, I've been able to kind of get around uh, when visualization. Uh, Bob, are you, what kind of approach would you use for this? 
I, I think you can get this well uh, also through a modified Jude because you do need to get to the medial border. Once you've reduced that full lateral border and the, well, so you want to get the shoulder reduced. You need to get lateral enough to get it reduced. Uh, that requires at least a larger limited incision or a full flap to make your um, modified Jude window. So I think doing a minimally invasive approach would be inadequate. I think it would be hard to do it through that. I'd want to see more. I also think that doing a complete Jude would make it very difficult because the pedicle would be in my way. So for those reasons, the large skin flap of the modified Jude with windows through it, I think would be the best option. I totally agree. Um, any other tips on how to approach this, uh, Peter, maybe? Um, no, I don't think so. I, I, uh, I, I think just to be, be aware that the, the suprascapular nerve and artery uh, are uh, likely in the fracture or in the callus. And so just to be acutely aware when you're performing your reduction maneuvers of that uh, glenoid. Uh, and I do agree with uh, fixation of the medial border in this case. So I like, um, I, I like the deltoid sparing modified Jude for this. Perfect. Peter, right, Andy, I'm gonna show what you did. Sure, I was, seeing, I, I was gonna ask Peter, are you, are you able to reliably see the superscapular nerve every time without elevating the deltoid? Oh yeah. With leaving the delta on? Yes. Okay. And you, right, can, you, you, you can see it emanate from the spinal glenoid notch um, if you're retracting like with an appendiceal retractor. Um, and, um, and, but you are not um, uh, staring at it. Uh, and so you have to be aware of who's retracting and how much and, and uh, it's a good question. What about intraarticular? You can still, you feel like you can still see intraarticular um, with the deltoid on. Uh, well, you know, it's interesting. It's a, it's an interesting question. Um, I rarely uh, make an arthrotomy from posterior, to be honest with you. Um, most glenoid fractures involve um, a. Uh, uh, a, a fracture line which can be reduced anatomically from the back without seeing the joint. In the same way we might um, reduce uh, an, an acetabulum through an ilioinguinal. You're not looking at the joint, you're, you're uh, reducing the exterior surfaces. So through the fracture, I would clean it out and get an anatomic reduction from the back and not do an arthrotomy. Um, I, I think if you do an arthrotomy, um, in, if, it, if it's a multi-fragmentary glenoid, which again, they're usually not, it's usually two fragments, but if there's third and fourth fragments, um, normally um, those are better visualized from the front, from a deltopectoral approach. So I might get stability of my lateral pillar uh, and glenoid neck from the back and then go to the front and work on the comminution once I have uh, um, you know, a posterior glenoid, glenoid on which I can um, lever a facuta retractor so I can reduce the um, articular fragmentation. Um, and, and certainly in a prone approach, I think it would be impossible in a lateral approach. Um, I, I uh, noted that you said you used a chance pin and, uh, uh, and the uh, Jonah said uh, spider retractor uh, with the shoulder positioner. Those are good ideas. I'm inclined to try it, but I don't typically do arthrotomies posteriorly. It's rare, not, not never. Um, and in those cases where I, I do need it, uh, I would be inclined uh, to take down the deltoid. In extreme cases, I've actually done an infraspinatus tenotomy, um, but I'm talking about like I can count on one hand the times I've done that. Yeah, Andy, I, I can't, I, I don't typically take the deltoid off. I'll abduct the arm enough with the arm positioner, uh, which releases the deltoid a little bit. I can get a retractor underneath um, the subacromial region. And then I can see, I don't see necessarily as well as you do uh, all the way to the front, but I can see that, you know, the fracture line, if it's a, a transverse fracture through the, the glenoid and you can see that line 
and then I can get a freer in to confirm, you know, anteriorly. But so you can see most of the most of the reduction from the back fairly well without taking the delta at all. Thank you. And then so there's a the question oh, about yeah. just the, just a, from the Q and A since this is for the fellows. Uh, there's a question about the cadaveric study showing limited exposure uh, when taking off the deltoid and whether or not that is would be different with a reverse Jude incision. Um, since this is addressed to Dr. Cole, what do you think? I, I don't think that the reverse Jude incision um, would would affect the um, the exposure. I mean, it gives you the same exposure of the musculature, specifically the posterior deltoid and the infraspinatus and teres. So if you're working in that interval, whether you're working through a classic Jude or a re reverse Jude incision, um, um, you know that 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 wouldn't affect it. the The study was done. Uh, through a mod a, 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 the classic raising of the subcutaneous flap off the fascia, to be clear, but I don't think it would matter. All right, thank you. So just for time, we'll kind of go through a little bit, unless Andy, you had something specific you wanted to un underscore here. No, I just, I just on the next slide, I just wanted to bring up this paper. And I, I think this was, I, I read this and I was very, uh, I, I really love this article. For those who haven't read it, this is out of JBGS Reviews. This is uh, Bartonacek out of Czech Republic. Um, and, you know, there, I get a lot of questions from residents about what a floating shoulder is. And I think this paper really, really illustrates an understanding of what the, the mechanics of the shoulder are. And one thing he says is that the effects of the SSSC, which you know, I don't know how much is taught now, really overestimated and that there is a difference between typical sort of glenoid neck fractures that exit medial to the coracoid base and then those that exit lateral and those that exit lateral like this guy really they have no other soft tissue ligamentous attachments and and he showed an example yeah, one more click jonah um so here's a glenoid fracture lateral it's extra articular but it's lateral to the coracoid base and you can see that the things like glenopolar angle don't apply anymore because the glenopolar angle is actually increased in these fractures because the only thing pulling on this glenoid now is the triceps. And so these typically displace distal and they pull into valgus from the pull of the triceps. And you could say, well, this is just a single disruption, but this is an inherently unstable glenoid fragment. And so when somebody shows a glenoid neck fracture, I think it's an important distinction that's not really um, sort of well publicized, so to speak. So if you wanna go forward, this is just what we did. We did do a posterior approach. I, I did take down the deltoid. Um, and in this case, uh, arthrotomy was essentially done because his humeral head was dislocated. His labrum was uh, torn. Uh, so we, we fixed everything um, through the posterior approach, through a, a, a Jude. Did take down the deltoid, provisional fixation, and then fixation along the lateral border into the coracoid base, into the intact superior segment. After this, I was not totally, we got some post-op x-rays and I wasn't totally convinced that this was well reduced just because if you look sort of on the lateral border, it doesn't look like a reduction there is that great. Uh, you can keep going, Jonah. One more, next uh, for the, just to show the final x-ray. So I wasn't totally sure that we actually got this right. And so we did get a post-op CT, which I don't typically do, especially for an extra articular scapula. Um, but in the end, we were actually pretty happy with the results. Um, next slide, you can just show the CTs. And so while I'm showing the CTs, uh, maybe just for the fellows, what size plates are you using for those small, you know, provisional plating? Uh, those are typically 2.0 and 2.4 plates. Um, those ones, especially when I'm putting them along uh, the spinal glenoid notch uh, in proximity to where the suprascapular nerve is going to be, I just try to keep them low profile. But the lateral border plates typically for me are 2.7. Okay. I don't know Bob, if you are guys you are doing using... Different. Similar, yeah, I was gonna say, are you using similar size? Yeah, something mini frag for provisional and then two seven locking. Peter, same. Yes, and, and I've um, gone to the uh, two four, uh, two four uh, for the medial angle because it's easier to contour. Yeah, I, I uh, we have this like little uh, gold uh, plate. I don't even know which company makes it, but that little gold 2-4 plate that's perfect for contouring the medial angle. And uh, we have it in a separate set, so I really, I agree with that. So, and I think that that case looks really, uh, that result looks really good. And uh, I'll just, there's your final uh, four-month follow-up. 
So anything specific of this case take home, you think, um, for the fellows to, to, to know? Yeah, again, I think that, um, you know, I think it's important to recognize that not, not all glenoid neck fractures, not all extra articular scapular fractures fall into the same bucket. And this is a, a little bit of a variant pattern. And it's important to recognize that this is not one you should try to treat non-operatively. This is inherently unstable. And my next take on points on the next slide, so, by the way, there's two <laughs> codes for this. There's one for the fixation of the scapula. It took me about four hours. Oh, it took me a while. It's about 14 RVUs. And then that 10-minute repair, I put a couple anchors in the posterior glenoid. And uh, that was uh, 16 RVUs. So, you know, for you trauma fellows out there, it's never too late to go into sports medicine. <laughs> there you go. I think that's an excellent case. Um, Peter, you have a case that you wanted to, to go through. Uh, we have about 15, 15, 20 minutes or so to kind of get through this. So I think this might be a good time to put that case through. We have extra cases, but just in the, in the, the um, you know, for time, I think we'll, we'll go through that. Uh, please fellows keep having your questions go through. If you have anything, uh, there's no better time than now. While you're loading that case, maybe I'll ask Andy, since you have uh, some experience, I've done this once, uh, putting a scope in uh, for the joint reduction. I think uh, I was sort of surprised at how well I could see uh, in the joint. And uh, obviously I, I scope shoulders on a regular basis a little bit like you. We have a very similar sort of background training wise, uh, both shoulder and elbow and, and trauma. Um, do you think that that might replace the arthrotomy um, using even like a smaller scope than normal potentially? Yeah, it's interesting because I just did a case last week where I used, um, I don't want to say any brand names, but it's a very, very small scope. It's, mm -hmm. uh, I mean, it's a it's banana scope. Yeah, disposable, <laughs> very, very small scope. And I actually yeah. had an arthrotomy and I could see the joint, but I just couldn't quite see anteriorly as well as I wanted. And I just put that in there and I could suddenly see very, very well. Um, I, I think there's probably a role for that. I think something like that is actually a, a pretty nice tool. And I actually got the idea from one of my partners who used it on a medial plateau. He's not an arthroscopist by any stretch, but he was always mentioning how hard it is to see your joint reduction on the medial plateau. So uh, yeah. I think there's definitely a role for that without having to bring in a tower and all that stuff. I think that's huge. And the one thing I'll say about that scope specifically is that there are, there's going to be a 30 degree one available and a 70 degree one available in the near future if it's not already. So um, potentially even easier to see going forward. So anyway, something to think about. All right, yep. Peter. All right, can you, can you see the screen? Yep. yep. Okay. All right, uh, so this is a, a relatively uh, uh, common mechanism of trauma uh, in our parts here. Uh, this guy's buddy was uh, filming uh, this accident. Boom. So uh, he had trying to advance my slide now. There you go. So um, hide my toolbar here. So um, this is what he presented with. Um, uh, he's a 32 year old snowboarder, no other injuries, isolated shoulder symptoms. Um, he was okay in a sling. He came to me at seven days out. Um, he's had two clavicle fractures in the past and they healed fine. And, uh, he had already seen three surgeons uh, and they, everyone said that uh, he didn't need anything for surgery. Um, this is his, um, uh, these are his injury films, um, and you can see a number of, um, I, I think, really interesting, uh, interesting things on this film. First of all, the angular deformity is fairly spectacular. Here's the glenoid. Uh, you can see here the humeral head uh, is uh, perched, subluxed, uh, posteriorly, as uh, this is the acromion, this is the coracoid. Um, and, the, and the glenoid in, is involved, possibly the coracoid. There's a lot of information on the, on the uh, 
uh, on the X-ray that uh, you know we we often we often miss. Uh, I, I'm paying a lot more attention to lateral implosion injuries of the entire forequarter, which is something that. Um, you'll hear a lot more about in the future, I think. But I'm looking at the clavicular chain, uh, the clavicle, the AC joint, uh, the rib fractures uh, that are underlying. Um, and anyway, this guy thought uh, that uh, anyone who told him that he didn't need surgery uh, was, was uh, just nuts. Um, a little more history. He's an engineer, married to a nurse, um, and a very healthy guy. Um, denied any other uh, problems, but uh, cervical spine injury, traumatic brain injury um, incidence is about 15% in operative scapula fractures. And um, the majority have uh, pneumothoraces. When he takes off, a, is always examined someone disrobed. And, and it's really interesting to appreciate um, some of the body morph morphometry uh, um, and uh, I've studied these angles and the shoulder height and uh, the nipple height and and uh, there's a there's a lot of bodily deformity which occurs with with these uh, injuries. Um, I won't go um, too much into the research, but um, you can look at the angles of the shoulder, the the uh, tosis which occurs, and even you know even the midline uh, uh, shifts. Uh, you can see that uh, when you when you examine these patients closely in later presentations. So here is the um, here's the uh, um, 3D CT. Um, you can see how helpful it is uh, to really understand, you know, what's going on. So um, we have, um, it's a partial glenoid fracture. We've got the coracoid involved. Um, here's the scapula itself. So not too much of the glenoid is involved, superior and anterior superior part of it. Um, so approaches uh, for this, shall we uh, pull the panel? Um, Andy, um, what what would be your inclination in terms of choosing an approach? This is an anterior and a posterior view. Um, thoughts? Yeah, so I, I mean, I would do a posterior approach. I think I would do a reverse Judea incision just because I don't think there's a lot you need to do medially. Um, for me, it's basically a stepwise. I try to save everything I can. I try not to take down the deltoid, but if I'm struggling, I take it down. I try not to reflect the infraspinatus completely, but if I'm struggling to see, uh, then I will take it down. So I sort of go in with a, um, I'll, I'll go and dissect as much as I need to, to do what I need to do. So I would start with the reverse today. Um, I think I would try to keep the deltoid on and just try to work in the intermuscular intervals at first. But if I was having trouble, especially just along the spinal glenoid notch, I haven't had the same success in seeing as I think you guys have uh, without taking down the deltoid, then I, I wouldn't hesitate to take it down and, and do more. Robert, Dr. Shafiq. Any yeah. other thoughts? No, I, I mean, I would. I don't really think I need a reverse Judea incision. I think a standard uh, modified Judea incision lifted up suture to the skin gives me adequate skin flap. So, but still it would be an intramuscular window and I think it could be all gotten from the back. Okay, Jonah, any, anything else? Yeah, the only thing I'm looking at the coracoid, is that off in the front or is that just a weird view from the, the CT? No. Yeah, it, it's thoroughly off. Yeah, so uh, I've had some ability to get these from the back, but usually for me, this would be a combined approach. I'd go from the back, fix the uh, scapula, fix the glenoid component to the scapula, plate that, and then go from the front and then fix the coronoid, or sorry, the coracoid, and uh, probably um, see if there was any other, you know, uh, ligaments off or anything like that and fix that as well. Okay. Um, one thing I want to point out, is my cursor showing? Yes. Yeah, so we've talked about these high-risk injuries that uh, go up through the spinal glenoid notch because that's right where the suprascapular nerve exits. And then it arborizes and, um, and provides supply to the infraspinatus. Um, but if you, if, if you study these fracture patterns, um, they e often exit uh, through or next to uh, 
the suprascapular notch. So here we are on the front side and the suprascapular notch, this is attached to a ligament, is actually fractured and displaced. The base of the cor coracoid um, is in the wind. So here's a fracture line that probably takes out the suprascapular nerve uh, by virtue of going right through its entire course from the spinal glenoid notch to the suprascapular notch. Um, and, you know, based on the displacement of the glenoid and the coracoid, you have to assume there was massive traction injury, if not frank tearing of the suprascapular nerve. So it's, um, uh, if the patient presents more than two weeks after the injury, I like to get preoperative EMGs and um, you'd be surprised how many, uh, I would say more than 30% uh, show um, a, a neurologic injury to the suprascapular nerve. Um, so um, this is what um, <clears throat> Andrew was uh, describing uh, before, uh, a situation in which a true anatomic neck fracture um, causes the glenoid to tip upward. So 57 degrees for a glenopolar angle is, is actually um, much higher than normal, which is typically around 35 to 40. Um, so, so these um, anatomic neck fractures, um, the uh, glenopolar angle is opposite. The, the, the degrees, the measurements have really never been studied or correlated with outcome. Um, so uh, not too much in the way of medialization. And no, we're look, we're uh, recognized here, we're, we're looking at uh, a, uh, the uh, body of the scapula straight on, but we're not looking at the glenoid straight on. And the reason is because that's spun around. So you can't, you can't really get a, a real Gracie view, right? Because the glenohumeral joint is spun. And this is the most dramatic part of the uh, uh, deformity, and that's the angular deformity. So certainly meets surgical indications. Uh, in addition, there's some glenoid involvement. The coracoid is involved. Um, so the surgical indications, we, we've got a, a double lesion of the superior shoulder suspensory complex, a displaced coracoid, and 70 degrees of angular deformity. And I think it's, it's important really to create a sequence of um, understanding exactly who you do and don't operate on. And you'd be surprised how many patients do not meet the criteria and uh, it's okay to watch them, uh, but you should get x-rays in a week and a two weeks because they often displace into a worse position. Um, so, um, you know, this is the typical uh, scapula fracture map. If I apply this patient's pattern, um, I'm, I'm asking myself, well, I don't really need to be at the medial border whatsoever. Um, and, and these are the fragments I want to reduce. Now, I just used a straight posterior approach. Um, and, uh, and so you have to retract the, uh, the, the deltoid um, cephalad and then get down in the infraspinatus teres interval. And what, what I'm going for is, is a restoration of the glenoid neck and, and, the, and the lateral pillar here. So um, I'll always put pilot holes like right off the bat and then I'll put clamps across the fracture lines. So I don't mess around with clamps until I have pilot holes drilled and then um, you can just put those vertical modified uh, uh, small pointed bone reduction clamps across the primary fracture lines. And you can see you don't need, I don't think you need a Jude or reverse Jude or anything. I mean, there's, there's not a lot of, this is a small window uh, through which to work. So my sequence of implants might be 2.7 and 2.4 to restore this glenoid neck. Okay, and then once that is uh, restored, again, no need for anything on the medial border. Um, this is, uh, you know, this is what it might look like. So this is definitely a case in which a combined approach is necessary, right? No, there's no good way to get to the coracoid. You, you can try to do it blindly, but you, you really have no good way of reducing the coracoid from posterior. So uh, this was addressed through a, a, a delto, a pectoral. Um, you, now, you don't necessarily need the arthrotomy 
uh, unless you want to assess the Ida Berg three type variants, the superior glenoids that are attached to the coracoid. But in this case, uh, two screws uh, for uh, fixation from the front through the base of the coracoid. And note too where where the screws go through. It's it's often tempting to kind of try to fix the coracoid with screws uh, in the um, in, in the distal part of the coracoid. But until you get down to the base, there's really you don't have the right real estate, and you always want to be angling your sc screws slightly lateral. Um, so this is the final fixation. And what's really Peter, can I ask a question? Just yeah, because absolutely. you have a really interesting uh, on your presentation. You basically 3D segmented the CT and then you moved the pieces around. Have you ever 3D printed the the 3D CT and tried to do that like with a fellow or with a resident beforehand to kind of uh, for teaching purposes or even for your own understanding? Is that is that something that's doable? Yes, absolutely. Um, in fact, um, I have uh, 3D prints of um, every malunion I've treated, and it's really helpful to be able to study the, the planes of your osteotomy and where you want your fixation. So the answer is yes, we have a, um, a, a 3D printing lab in our scapula institute, and, and, and I don't do it for the acute fractures, but I do it for, for the, not the malunions. Yeah, um, I've, I've actually started doing it because we've gotten a new printer where it's relatively cheap now. Um, and I print two copies. And I give one to the patient uh, because yeah. it's weird. Sometimes they don't understand what the bone looks like. They don't really get the CT. But if you give them a, a hunk of uh, 3D printed material, they kind of, oh, OK. And then the other one I use, I deconstruct it so that the pieces all move. I don't know. Other faculty, have you guys had any um, experience with that at all? We don't have a 3D printer available, as far as I know. <laughs> you might want to check with the engineers. Sometimes they hide it and they have it available. And you don't even know the Department of Orthopedics paid for it because it's for some research guy. You know, <laughs> That's what it was for ours. And we ended up having access to it. Good point. I don't do it routinely, but I, where I do use it is for intraarticular malunions, where I want to do an intraarticular osteotomy. Cool. Something to think about for the fellows, if you have access to it. Um, for, for 3D, you know, representation in your mind, sometimes it can be very, very helpful to see that fracture uh, printed out and kind of figuring out where the, the clamps went and everything. You know, I, I really like what you said about the, the patient educate patients absolutely love the 3D models. I mean, they, they, they hang on to it like a trophy. I'm sure many of them go on the mantle. Um, uh, it, it's great for patient education and just general interest and experience. You know, my rehab is pretty standard um, for, it, it really doesn't even matter what approach I use. I, I just do full passive and active range of motion. If you don't take down the deltoid, there's not a whole lot to worry about. Even, even in the um, extensile Jude approaches, I think they auto protect and uh, figure out their progression um, and, uh, and so it's, it's just very easy because the patients understand, the therapists understand, you know, month one, full passive and active range of motion, month two, three to five pounds of weight, and then you just release res restrictions after three months. Um, so this, this patient did in fact have an abnormal EMG, very severe axillary and suprascapular neuropathy. And... Um, I examine um, all our patients uh, with range of motion and strength uh, testing. You can see um, this uh, wasting of the, the infraspinatus, but it's amazing how functional um, that they are. Now, this is not the same patient I showed you, but um, it is a, a similar injury. Um, so, um, this is, I, I was able to follow this snowboarder for five years. And what's interesting here, it took about six months uh, after his axillary nerve and suprascapular nerve um, uh, recovered, then he regained all his motion and strength. And this is his, his strength chart. So the injured side is the blue and the non-injured side is the orange. And uh, 
And then his dash score at six months when he started to get that axillary and suprascapular nerve function back, um, it just it just happened overnight. Um, so it was uh, uh, impressive to to watch how that corresponded with the neurologic injury. Thank you, Peter. Can I ask so, two questions? Maybe three. Um, so number one. Uh, when you do an anterior approach that is set to, to reduce the coracoid, are you repositioning the patient? Are you doing that um, in a lateral or prone position? Or probably not prone, but are you doing that in a lateral position? Or are you just sort of taking them down, repositioning, reprepping, and the whole thing? Yeah, coracoids are tricky, and I prefer to reposition and redrape. You know, the orientation um, is is really. Um, tough to get. You have to be pointing your drill very distal and about 20 degrees lateral to get any real estate in the in the glenoid neck. Now, if it's a combined clavicle and scapula, I do that through one prep and drape. You know, I work from the front or over the top on the clavicle, um, and then just um, and that you you save your setup time. But with coracoids, I I prefer to. Uh, to have a separate prep and drape. And then when you're reducing it, are you able to get a clear um, anatomic reduction or are you sort of, are you, are you sort of more getting it back to where you know it's supposed to be? Because I've found coracoid fracture, coracoid base fractures without doing an arthrotomy. You know, if they don't have some of the superior glenoid on, with it, it uh, you know, it, it's uh, the coracoid's a difficult bone to work around. Uh, in terms of getting a good cortical read on. Yeah, anyone who says that they they uh, look at their reduction is not really telling the truth. Uh, you, 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 there's no possible way. That, that's Those ligaments, the corticoclavicular ligaments are like uh, bands of leather, uh, which, which, you know, is presupposed in your question. So it's a great question. I don't try to see it. Um, there was a time when I would, I would sort of scrape those ligaments off the base of the coracoid to, to try, and even then, all I can do is feel the fracture. I can't see it. So it, what I do is, is exactly like you. I saw you put a, a, a clamp, a lobster claw on, on your coracoid. I usually use a four millimeter chance pin, and uh, I just don't put the chance pin where I want my screws to go. And I use the chance pin like a joystick, and I derotate it, and I, I compress it, and then I'll uh, put in my two 3.5 screws typically for anti-rotation. Now, very few uh, coracoid fractures actually fracture at the stock, uh, like up, up in this area. Now, when that happens, obviously, it's, it's, a, it's a much different kind of fracture, but that's rare. Um, and uh, so, um, yeah, great question. It's an indirect reduction. Thank you. All right, uh, Dr. Cole, if you can stop sharing just so I can do the wrap up, perfect. Um, so if there are any questions uh, from the fellows, um, we thank you for being on here. Now's a great time if you have any sort of burning questions for the scapula or glenoid. Uh, we know that it's a complex um, fracture, complex joint. I think a lot of time is spent during fellowship on, you know, pelvis and acetabulum, and that's what everybody wants to see when they go to fellowship. But in reality, this is uh, much harder to deal with. It's uh, like a smaller acetabulum. Um, and so if you get good at this, you can get really good at acetabulum. So I would say tell your mentors to worry about the scapula and glenoid first, and then you can take care of anything. So if you have any questions, now's a good time. Otherwise, I'll just go through some of the take-homes. I think knowing the approaches, knowing the anatomy is probably the most important thing. Uh, when you're a fellow, knowing uh, being maximally invasive is probably uh, better than being minimally invasive. And then as you get more comfortable with the anatomy, then you can limit and modify and decrease the extent the extensile approaches. So start big. Um, last thing you want to do is feel uncomfortable, uh, especially in your first handful of cases when you're getting your learning curve. So don't be afraid to go big. Uh, know lots of reduction techniques. We had a great talk by Dr. Cole about 
all the different instruments and all the different things we can use, shan spins, shoulder hooks, um, different reduction clamps. Think about strategy of where you're gonna put those reduction tools so that they'll be out of the way of provisional fixation so that then you can get definitive fixation. Try to plan that on your preoperative planning. If you're lucky enough to get a 3D printed one, sure, or on the CT scan or even draw it out because I think especially as you're starting, it'll be very helpful uh, to do that. One of the other things you can do is get a uh, draw array, uh, dry erase uh, scapula like they have for the pelvis and you can draw out that stuff on a 3D version. It won't be exactly your patient, but it'll be close enough. And then finally, think about stable fixation. We don't need large fragment or even you know 3.5 millimeter plates for most of these small frag, mini frag. Um, very fragment specific, I think is much more useful in the scapula than it is in most bones. Uh, although we tend to have been going to that in a lot of other things as well in trauma, uh, but really try to fix every fracture line that needs fixing stable fracture fixation so that you can get people moving. I think the rehab slide from the last case really shows that uh, the goal of these is to get people moving as soon as possible. I, I, I don't know about the other faculty, but you know, I put a big whack on these people on the back of their shoulder. We spent four hours fixing their scapula and then they thanked me in the, in the PACU because their shoulder feels more normal. It's one of the weirdest things in all of orthopedic trauma. Like we, we do this huge approach on them and in the PACU, they're just like, oh my God, it feels so much better. You know, everything is good. You know, there, there may be a little bit in days still, but it's, it's really good. So you have to have stable fixation to, um, to get them moving again and know the screw corridors, like we were talking about for the coracoid or for other places, there's areas that lend themselves well to those uh, screws. And so I think it's a good, it's good to know that. Um, of note, the AO would like you to know that there's two more, or the, sorry, the, the next two AO uh, webinars for fellows are gonna be October 13th for Astagulum uh, and November 10th for bone defects. Look for emails uh, for those invitations. And if there's no other questions, then I'll thank the faculty. I really appreciated learning from all three of you today. Um, great discussion. And I'll thank the participants for being here and supporting the AO. Um, and that's it.